Welcome back everybody. Here I am continuing to work on those leaves in the top right of the picture. I'm very fussy about having just the right amount of colour, just the right amount of tone, just to get that feel where the leaves are completely forward of the background. So I need lots of pigment in there. Just as with painting, the more pigment you lay down, the richer and the more vibrant the colours can be. They will stand out, even at distance from the painting, they'll stand out because of the depth of pigment that's going in. I have to keep patting it down with my finger as well, just to make sure that it doesn't just become too dusty. You've got to keep everything workable with pastel. So I use my finger a lot just to bed in and then skimming over thinly there with the pencils just to tidy everything up and get some gradation of colour. Finally here we are getting rid of that branch. A little bit more pigment is all it needed and the branch has completely disappeared. No one will ever know that it was there. Well, you will, of course, but nobody else. Now, a few highlights with the white. And once I'm happy with the way those leaves look over on the right hand side, I can switch my attention to the entire background once again and just refine it. I've got all the base colour in, all that hard work getting those gradations of colour, that's all done. Now I can have fun and I can just refine details, bring up richer colours, always remembering that I don't want to do that too much because then it would detract from the distance that I'm putting between the bird and the forest. So I've got to be a little bit careful not to go too far, but I do want some nice nice detail this is the bit we've been waiting for really in the whole picture but look how nicely the light now looks the light the sunlight the early morning sun is pouring through the canopy we're starting to get the effect that we've been wanting all this time patience you always have to have patience patience and a good measure of confidence confidence in your own abilities. I, I really believe in that. You've got to have faith in yourself that you can do something. Painting is a mental activity, a mental game. It really is. And you have to develop the right mindset in order to be successful. I mean, this is a very big project and it's no use going into a marathon project like this unless you've got your mind in the right place you have to be able to stay focused stay positive from beginning to end not only do I monitor the painting but I also monitor myself my frame of mind and what I've noticed is the better I feel about myself the more positive I feel the better I paint so cast away any negative thoughts and any doubts and maintain a very positive approach to painting and that way you will be more successful. A positive attitude is as important for an artist as it is for a fighter or an athlete. You have to approach it with a very determined and positive way that you are the master here and you can do it. It's no use trying to do a painting full of frustrations and full of anguish and thinking that uh, doubts all the time, thinking it's going to fail. Banish such thoughts. See yourself as the master and channel that energy wherever it comes from, that creative energy, let it flow. Let it flow and you'll be a better artist. Be calm, relax and paint.
I'm talking of mindset, it's also the way you see things. You have to adjust your mind or consciously force your mind to see things differently. Imagine you're painting in black and white. That can help you to see the tonal values. You've got to consciously take the colour away in your mind and learn to judge colour. Look at this image, too much colour. Judge your paintings in the same way. Is there too much colour, too vivid? Or perhaps too little colour? Have I not added enough? You've got to look for these things. Look for, judge it, tonal value. Is it strong enough? Colour, strong enough or too weak? Maybe it's the hue of the colour that's off. Evaluate these things constantly. And on top of all that, there's the drawing side of things. How is the drawing aspect looking on the painting? Does it look a bit false? Is the style a little bit too detailed? Too many straight lines? Too many fine points? Evaluate everything as you work. Sometimes you stare at your painting so long that you can no longer see it. Try taking it to a mirror which will enable you to see it flipped horizontally. That way you can judge it very well. It's like seeing it fresh and the mistakes will pop out. Any mistakes you've made in the drawing, they'll be there for you to see. Hopefully there won't be any, but if there are, it's a great technique for um, assessing, judging. I'm a great believer in continuously assessing and judging everything you do. It's the only path to perfection. Let's just take a moment to have a look at some pastels. I'll show you the pastels that I prefer to use and we'll talk a little bit about sharpening. Very, very important aspect of pastel painting, which everybody overlooks. But sharpening is key to so many things. So let's dive straight in. Now, a pencil like this doesn't really do much. You need to get a lot sharper. A very good sharpener are these. These are Helix pencil sharpeners and they work very, very well most of the time. They do have an annoying habit of packing up after a month or two, but they're cheap enough and they're useful enough uh, for me to continue with them because they give a beautiful, beautiful result. You just put the pastel pencil in like this and then nice sound, you know you've got a beautiful, beautiful sharp edge. And that, my friends, is what we need for pasteling. Sometimes I also take a blade and just manipulate the edge to make it more of a more of an edge more of a chisel edge on a very minute scale if I'm doing something like uh, whiskers and things but that is beautiful and let me see that is not most people that I teach, they do everything with a pencil that looks like that. Not good. Sharpening with a blade. I do an awful lot of the sharpening with blades. You have to use a blade for something like uh, the Caran d'Ache pencils. You, you have to have a blade for those uh, because the pencil sharpener simply won't work. So all we do as long as the blade is sharp, that's another thing. These pastels blunt a razor blade pretty quickly. So you do have to keep using fresh blades. But this is what I would do. I don't sharpen these to a, a point, but rather to a bit of a chisel edge. There, just like that. Hold, hold your thumb near where you're 
sharpening. People, when they say to me, oh, I can't sharpen um, pencils with a razor blade, the reason for that generally uh, is that they're holding it way back here. And they, uh, uh, what you need to do is get your thumb under it. And then you've got very fine control and you can get a beautiful chisel edge to a Caran d'Ache pencil. And when you've got an edge like that, the world is your playground. You can do whatever you want with a beautiful, beautiful sharp point. Good for whiskers, things like that. <clears throat> so pe people sometimes think of the sticks as being a little bit more clumsy, a little bit less precise. Well, they don't have to be if you sharpen them well. Now I will sharpen a unison pastel, for example, in the same way as I'll, uh, as I'll sharpen a pencil. I'll take it to a chiselled edge. Can you see that edge there? How sharp that is on the edge? So even though it's a very soft pastel, it can make lines that are nice and precise. You do have to refresh the point, but it can do some very nice fine marks. So there we have it. All the pastel sticks can be sharpened with a blade to make beautiful straight clear lines sharpened to an edge very very easily uh, so that's the way the sticks are sharpened we've seen how the pencils are sharpened you can also sharpen um, the, the stabilos very very easily because the wood is softer than the caran d'ache so these actually sharpen with a blade even even quicker than the Caron Dash ones. Let me just show you this very, very quickly. Sharpen it to a super nice little point. There, we can get a nice line with that. Make nice, precise marks on our pastel matte surface. That's a homemade pencil rack, you can see there, made with some plastic tubing. Now what I want to show you here is where I keep my pastels right next to my workstation. This is, you may recognise it, it's a mechanics tool trolley. A fantastic thing to put your pastels in. They have lots of different drawers where you can arrange the pastels and they're very mobile things. When I do teaching private tuition and I have to take my pastels somewhere, I can just roll the trolley out, put it in the car and take it there. So it's a very, very practical thing. Each drawer contains a different type of pastel. Those are unisons. Before that we had the Caran d'Ache some softer Sennelias there with some wipes which are always handy to keep your hands clean. These are Terry Ludwig soft pastels, those are the dark sets which I really love and next to them the Henry Rochers. You can put so much into a tool trolley and the beauty is that it's all there ready available at your fingertips. You don't have to have everything spread out around the easel. Okay, first of all, let's talk about Stabilo Carbothello. These are the best pastel pencils you can buy. They are fabulous for smoothly glazing and also for very fine lines. Very, very, very good for layering, very smooth wonderful pencil. 
and is a really wonderful pencil. Prismacolor, new pastel Prismacolor. These are beautiful. Beautiful pastels. They go on very, you can do very nice fine lines. You can do very good layers. It's a new one, Prismacolor. I think they are excellent. Of course, Unison Pastel. Unison Pastel are absolutely superb. I always use them very lightly. A very, all that's needed to put a, a background base on is a very thin layer like this. You don't press hard like that, you get too much dust. You just need a thin layer like this. And then with your finger, you can smooth it out. Always make sure that your finger is clean. I had a bit of dark dust there on my finger and if you notice it mixed in with the pastel, so you don't want that. You can always add a, a second layer as well, just to fill in any gaps. And there we can get a perfect finish. And the good thing about using Stabilo Carbothello in conjunction with Unison is the Stabilos can beautifully glide over the top of a, of a Unison base. And you can blend very softly those colours one into the other. So fine adjustments of colour can be made this way. See how beautifully soft it is already? And of course you can always apply sharper sharper details on top of that unison layer. So these working in conjunction with each other, Stabilos and Unisons, that's something I do a lot. Now another pastel that maybe isn't in the video, maybe I didn't have them at the time, but I use them a lot these days, and that is Caran d'Ache. Caran d'Ache are fabulous pastel pencils. They're really, really good. They are perhaps the most powerful of the pastel pencils. They give a very nice... They're all, they almost behave like a pastel stick rather than a pencil. They're so loaded with pigment. They're... Um, A very 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 good pencil. The only thing I don't like about the Caran d'Ache pencil is they're harder to sharpen. Sharpening is a little bit of a, a pain because the wood is too strong. I don't know why they use this wood but it's very strong and it makes the sharpening very difficult. But despite that these are a real Swiss made excellent pastel pencil. Another excellent pastel, if you want very soft pastel, is the Sinilias. These are super soft, so you have to be very, very gentle with the way you use them. But these also, like the Unisons, buttery smooth, fabulous for laying down rich, strong colours wherever you need them. You don't always need them in a painting, but wherever you need to put a powerful tone, Sinilia are fabulous. I always recommend in a pastel studio having some wipes. It's always good to keep your blending fingers clean. And just a quick wipe and take away the pastel dust. Incidentally, if you make a mistake on a pastel painting, you can use a wipe to take away the dust completely. Then you just leave that for a couple of minutes to dry and you're good to go again. That's a, a very useful little tip.
what else do we have here <coughs> the other soft pastels this is the dark set of Terry Ludwig pastels beautiful beautiful strong strong colors absolutely beautiful soft pastels you've got to be careful with because they they're very powerful and they fill up the tooth of the paper very very quickly uh, these certainly do that but just used in the right places they've got a, a real power to them so again something to consider when you want rich strong colors this is the dark set I have two sets of the Terry Ludwig darks and I think they're excellent also often consider the, the finest of all pastels the Henry Rocher pastels they are extremely good extremely powerful pigments a little bit on the dusty side but they've got a, a style all of their own I, I, I find they are um, they are beautiful they're the most expensive pastels I've ever known but I wouldn't be without them they are uh, they are excellent they really are other pastels that are extremely useful are the, and very cheap on the other end of the scale to the Henry Rocher are the Conti little Conti square hard pastels not as powerful in pigment but they certainly have their place I use them for making little little marks over a base color it could be for fur they're very good for that they're not so good for a, a flat base I prefer them for final little touches and if you notice they are sharpened to a chisel edge this is the way I like to use pastel sticks sharpened to a chisel edge one thing I would like to mention is that it's always a good idea to have some kind of air filtration system in your studio when you're using pastels. Pastels, as you may have noticed, when you're sharpening them or when you're using them, there are minute particles of pastel dust created. Now, these are not the healthiest things uh, to be breathing in all day long. Um, you know, they're not overly toxic, but the particles are very, very minute, and so they can build up in your lungs and make you feel a bit wheezy. Um, so for that reason, what I have is, a, is a, an air filtration system. I have a blue air filter. Now this filters air particles right down to the size of, I think it's 0.1 micron, which um, is small enough to take out the, even the most minute particles of pastel dust out of the air, uh, which Really, I wouldn't work without it. I think it, it's just nice to know that your air, your airflow is being uh, very well filtered. Well, this is it. It's a blue air filter. Very, very nice thing. We just turn it on and you can hear the air, clean, fresh air blows out of the top. It's a beautiful thing well worth having in your studio I have it right next to where I sharpen the pencils so if I sharpen my pencils here uh, I'll be sharpening them next to the filter it's a HEPA filter it'll filter anything even apparently viruses um, and it'll filter your room in no time cleans the air there are three different settings as well when it's on full power it's like a cool wind coming out there it can filter the whole room in no time at all so for peace of mind uh, when pastelling I think it's nice to have something like this I'll put a link in um, for you so you could maybe consider 
getting something like that. There are many on the market. I'm not sponsored for this product or anything like that. It just happens to be the one I use. But um, do look into air filtration systems. I think they are, they are an important um, thing for pastelists. Another thing I'd like to mention is at the beginning of the DVD, I mentioned that I put the pastel mat onto a board and taped it around. Well, as you know, it's been a few years since uh, the video, the DVD was made. And in that time, I've switched to uh, a new technique or a new style of working, which is this. It's a, a magnetic board. So with magnets, we can very easily put the corners, protect the corners. We can move things around very, very quickly, very, very easily. I love using magnets on a magnet board. Not only that, but your references, you can, you can stick them on. These magnets, I just bought them on from Amazon. They're about £6.99 for a pack of six or something like that. Very, very useful. They just can pin your references to the board. So everything is very, 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 very adjustable when you're working with magnets. I just love that. You can just move everything around so much more easily than the way it used to be on like a fixed easel board. Magnetic whiteboard, again, I just got it from Amazon. I think it was about 24 pounds. I just screwed it to my easel and, and off we go. And that brings us to the end of part four. Thank you for watching. In part five, we'll get back to the painting, back to finishing off those hornbills and bringing the foliage at the bottom of the painting to life to finish everything off. <laughs>